So welcome. Uh, my name is, is Roger Berkowitz. Uh, I'm the, the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome to the virtual reading group. Uh, we are uh, continuing to read uh, this collection of Arendt's essays called The Promise of Politics, uh, edited by uh, Jerome Cohn. And um, uh, this, this is a, a collection that now um, is going to consist of, of writings in the 1953-54 era. Um, and really, uh, well, there's, 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 two, there's two things going on. Um, one is uh, Arendt is currently working on a book um, called The Modern Challenge to, Tra to Tradition. The Modern Challenge to Tradition. For some reason, that's a tongue twister for me. Um, and uh, it's, it's very much centered on, on the work of, of Karl Marx. Um, and so in this period, um, she's, she's reading a lot of Karl Marx and is thinking about a, a book that would see Karl Marx as the um, thinker who brings the Western tradition of political thought to its end uh, or challenges it. Um, she's going to also see in Marx um, who she says is brilliant and important and um, needs to be saved from his critics to some degree. But she's also going to see in Marx um, deeply dangerous, uh, dangerous um, uh, premonitions um, that in bringing the tradition to its end, she doesn't mean destroying it here so much as she means culminating it. And in the culmination of this tradition, um, we see a grave threat to plurality and a drive to um, oneness of thought that she says is in many ways the intellectual um, uh, uh, precursor to totalitarianism. Um, this does not mean that Marx is the totalitarian thinker. I, I, I don't want, I hope nobody uh, takes it to mean that or takes me to be saying that or aren't to be saying that. Um, but uh, she is interested in the way that totalitarianism, which as you all know, I hope she says is a, a break uh, with the tradition and a break with the past um, is also in some way prepared by this tradition. Um, and that Marx as the end of the tradition uh, plays a significant role in that. And so the, 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 in 1953, she writes numerous, numerous drafts of different speeches and essays with all with the title in some way, um, the tradition of political thought, the end of the tradition of political thought, Karl Marx and the end of traditional thought. There's a lot of drafts and a lot of um, uh, 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 work that she's doing and she applies for grants so that she can work more on this book. Um, so that's the first thing that's going on at this period in her life, in her intellectual life. And the second thing is that she fails, right? This book never, uh, never gets written, um, the, the modern challenge tr to tradition. And the different elements of it get put into different projects. So um, one, some of the stuff that we read in um, Essays and Understanding uh, get put into newer versions of the origins of totalitarianism and become essays rethinking totalitarianism. And then much of the other work, especially the work on Marx and the work on action, um, becomes the genesis of her new book project, The Human Condition, right? And, um, and so what you're seeing in these essays on the tradition of political thought 
is many ways the, the sort of early working out of, of what will be the human tradition, the human condition. And those of you who've read the human condition will, will notice a lot of that. Um, uh, and if you haven't, we're gonna read it soon and uh, you'll get to see it uh, in many ways. So, so this is a great book to read right before we read the human condition it actually works really well um, in that. So um, this, this essay that Jerome Cohn edits as um, the tradition of political thought um, is actually uh, in her notes, the first draft uh, from 1953 for her Christian Gauss seminar, which she gave at Princeton University, uh, which as a title for the whole seminar was called Karl Marx and the Tradition of Political Thought. As I said, her notes are a bit, um, you know, incomplete. And so there are segments and, and, and what, what, what Jerome Cohn here has published is one of those segments, one of those drafts. And um, so let's, you know, this is a, in a sense, let me say that this is a bit um, of her working out some very difficult uh, academic, intellectual, traditional things. And um, at least, and it, while it will have incredibly important resonances for her contemporary thinking about politics, um, this is probably the period in her career where she's most academic. Um, she's actually giving some talks at things like the American Political Science Association. And, um, and so there's a, there's a way in which this can be a little bit abstract. And so I'm gonna try and, and, and draw you through it. She's reading a lot of Aristotle, she's reading a lot of Marx, a lot of Plato and others. So um, how do we understand this, this text? Um, she begins it by saying, um, if we, that it's, it's called the tradition of political, the tradition of political thought. And she says, if we speak of the end of tradition, now you only would know what she's talking about if you had been, this is actually the second Gauss lecture. And the first Gauss lecture is a preface or introductory lecture in which she speaks of the end of tradition. Um, and uh, she says that um, Marx is the end of tradition. And what does she mean by that? She says, and we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have a chance to read this stuff coming up later, but I think it's helpful to put it out front, that for Marx, Marx, is, Marx has three doctrines, she says, which are central to his work. One is that the labor, labor is the creator of man, and thus not God is the creator of man, that man creates himself through labor. Two is that violence is the midwife of history, and thus not action, which is unpredictable and uncontrollable, but violence, which is a means and activity, um, is what makes things happen. That the, the changes happen in the world, not through action, which is again, spontaneous and beginning, but not knowing where it's going and not controlled, but by violence, which is an attempt to control things. And third, that the philosophers have interpreted the world, but the time has come to change it. Um, and whereas philosophy was prior to Marx seen as um, the uh, as 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 a, as a as a as a retreat or flight from the world, um, now philosophy is going to enter the world as a combatant to try and change it through violence, uh, through the labor of man. Um, and so uh, the end of tradition is, is that this is the culmination, she's arguing, of a long um, tradition of political thinking uh, that um, undoes what she considers to be the political experiences that people have throughout history that are counter to the tradition. What she's basically doing is setting up a war or a battle between tradition 
and a, a, a tradition of political thinking, right? Which goes from Plato to Marx, more or less in her, in her telling. And this tradition of political thinking is an attempt to um, uh, develop uh, a, 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 a standards and customs and, and um, uh, criteria for determining what is good and bad, right and wrong. And this tradition of political thinking stands against all of that other stuff, the action that it rejects, that it suppresses, that it um, seeks to uh, um, uh, renounce and, and hold down. And so there's this battle going on for 2000 years from Plato to Marx between sort of a subversive stream of action and the tradition which wants to clamp down on that action. And, um, and, so, and so that's the, that's the story she's, she's telling. Um, she says in this essay that many people today still live by traditional values, or some do. She says, I don't know how many, maybe some, whatever. But she says the tradition today um, is silent when it's confronted by modern questions. And this is what is going to lead to her to speak about the break in tradition, right? That past standards no longer make sense in light of, she says, on the one hand, she mentions four different things in this essay, industrialization, the industrial revolution. So the industrial revolution breaks apart past traditional standards of how we do politics and how we relate to another as political beings. Um, second, science. Science, because science looks beyond common sense, it breaks apart the traditional understandings of, of politics. Universal equality, insofar as universal equality um, uh, uh, denies this idea of political equality. Uh, that was so important in politics. Um, it also breaks apart the tradition. And then the idea of progress, namely that um, uh, the world progresses infinitely forward and backward, and there's not a beginning and an end. Um, all of these four things, she says, are going to break tradition, are going to show that tradition is incapable of dealing with them. But that's getting ahead of her story, although it's in the text, so I put it there. What is tradition? So this is a very basic question. Um, tradition, she says, um, is that which is accepted and absorbed by common sense. It's the traditio. It's traditio in, 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 in Latin means to be carried over. It's, it's what's what from the past we salvage and we carry over into the present. Um, she says, uh, tradition is the great power of exclusion of all action that does not fit into its framework on page 47. I'll say that again. Tradition is the great power of exclusion of all action that doesn't fit into its framework. What tradition does is it picks from the past those actions, those beautiful and non-beautiful actions, to quote Aristotle as she does on page 46, it picks from the past those actions which are useful and which fit its framework. And uh, in doing so, it excludes all the other actions of history um, which don't fit its framework. And we then have these traditions, right? That you take your hat off when you walk in or you open the door or, or, or how you act and, and traditions of customs, how you eat with you know, manners. And, and these are tra traditions. She then says that common sense um, is the public realm of politics and morality that fits the idiosyncratic data of our senses as a plurality into a common world. 
And tradition are those data of what we share, of what we've carried over from the past, which we share, which are then um, fitted into common sense or absorbed by common sense to create a common world, a political world that we hold in common. And so um, tradition and common sense are tightly wound, right? Tradition is the, is the data that's carried over that forms the common sense, which fits us into a common world. Um, against tradition, she now offers the idea of history. And so we have, it's very important in this text to understand the opposition of tradition and history. History, she says, is not the same as tradition. That's on 42. With the Romans, she says, remembering the past became tradition because what the Romans did is they turned back to the past and they picked up those things they wanted to remember. But in doing so, they excluded a lot. A. B, they began to think of time as a chronological time, as an infinity that goes infinitely into the past and infinitely into the future. And in telling this history, um, this tradition, right, um, they, they ignore or suppress most of history. Um, uh, as so she says, the vast majority of history escapes tradition. Tradition is thus defective in terms of history. So what does tradition exclude in history? Well, I mean, a lot. But she now develops what she calls three fundamental political experiences that were pre-political or pre-polis and thus pre-traditional. Um, and that these are the fundamental political experiences that in many ways um, she wants to salvage in the human condition over and against the tradition. Um, one of these, the first one, is the pre-political experience of the Greeks in the Homeric world. Um, the Greeks in the Homeric world were doers of deeds, great deeds. And the Greek early historians, like Thucydides, records great deeds and events. And Herodotus says he writes to save deeds from oblivion. These historians and poets um, tell the story of great deeds to save their greatness, to save them from fading into, uh, in, 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 well, into oblivion. Um, they don't tell them in order to put them into a traditional order that will lead to a common world that will lead to means ends rationality. Aristotle and Plato, as the first political thinkers of the polis, think, rethink the, the Greek Homeric pre-political experience, as she says on page 45, in terms of the polis. They set these great acts and action into a categorical, categorical system of means and ends, of ruling and being ruled of interests and moral standards. This system excludes the spirit of starting an enterprise and together with others, seeing it through to the conclusion, she writes on page 45. So what Plato and Aristotle do is they take action and say, look, the only actions that matter are the ones that fit into our system of creating a good polis based on the good or the beautiful. And we lose this sense of um, a kind of, uh, of, of, of simply spontaneous action of being a beginner who doesn't begin with some end and doesn't know where their end or their action will lead, but is simply, if their beginning is, is, is exciting and is uh, recognized by others, followers, 
it becomes something that people follow and it leads down a road that nobody knows where it's going to go. Um, and so tradition now opposes this pre-political experience of action and seeks to impose permanent rules on the changing circumstances uh, and unstable affairs of acting men. And it's governed by what she calls the great power of exclusion. The second pre-political experience is the Roman, so the first was Greek action. The second is the Roman pre-political experience of foundation. Um, the, the Romans were the people who fled Greece as refugees, Aeneas and, and his band of Trojan warriors, and founded um, uh, Rome. And they made a religion of founding and preserving a civitas on page 47, she writes. And at the core of the Roman pre-political experience is this belief in founding and preserving a civic world. Uh, and thus the whole of Roman history is based on this foundation as the beginning for an eternity, the setting down of home, family, and city, and the piety and the gods that support them. And this experience, um, she says, uh, leads the Romans to develop as a pre-political experience, the need for religion, authority, and tradition to work together to preserve a foundation. The third pre-political uh, experience that she talks about is the Christian pre-political experience. And, and here she says that it, it, in many ways it mirrors the Roman uh, Trinity, I mean, literally, um, but uh, the, 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 the sort of the heart, the beating heart of it is Jesus's uh, preaching of forgiveness. Um, forgiveness as the response to the frailty of human action. So if, if the Greek response to the frailty of human action is poetry and history where we memorialize actions that will disappear and be lost, um, if the Roman response to the frailty of human action is we set up the trinity of religion, authority, and tradition to found something that will last, the Christian response to the frailty of human action um, is uh, forgiveness by which um, uh, we respond to someone who does acts uh, with the phrase, forgive them my for they know what not what they do. Um, these are all, she says, deeply human actions, foundation, forgiveness, greatness. And they are all deeply human actions that the tradition needs to exclude because they are unpredictable, they're frail, they can't lead to a means and rationality. They're not conducive to rulership and being ruled. And so the tradition um, seeks to suppress and exclude these actions, which would um, uh, represent a kind of um, uh, eternal spontaneous rejection of any, any, any rule or any hege hegemony. And so what is it that she ends this essay with? She says, what's lost in the completion of tradition, what's lost in the victory of tradition is simply the fact of plurality, right? Um, the fact that first of all, it is possible to conceive a human world, a man-made edifice under the conditions of oneness of man. Namely, it's possible that tradition can succeed, that tradition can in the end create a singular totalizing edifice that um, sees all man as one. But it's the second point she makes is that the human condition of plurality um, is incompatible with that and is the equally manifest only in the absolute distinction from one equal from another. And, and so this, this little essay, this Gauss lecture, which is very early draft of a lot of her thinking, what is it about? It's about the contest between 
the tradition of political thought that seeks to exclude the excess of history, of action as, as greatness, of action as foundation or revolution, which you'll come to see foundation as revolutionary action and action as forgiveness with a kind of uh, socio-philosophical socio expert-driven uh, knowledge, which is designed to organize society according to one or common goals. And that this traditional political tradition uh, stands in conflict with the basic fact of human plurality. All right, so, um, you know, like I said, this is a, a sort of a, a draft. It's, it's just working out some of these ideas, but these are really important ideas that will come back uh, deeply in Arendt's work over the next decade. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, um, let's see. I hope, you know, again, I, I do realize that this is a little more technical than some of the other works we've read recently, um, but uh, we'll see how, see how you guys enjoy it or respond to it. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, I see a question from Rick, Rick O. Hello all. Um, I just wanna to try to add a couple of pieces um, to, to what you said. I, I certainly obviously agree with everything you said, but I just wanna add a few things. But first to do that, I wanna back up to something we briefly touched on last week, just really quick. It's probably my favorite quote from Heidegger. We talk about Heidegger's method and it comes from um, his basic problems. It's, a, it's only one sentence. Um, and it's the idea that philosophically what Heidegger wanted to do and, and Arendt I think does the same thing is look at what's going on and see what maybe got missed or got twisted and see if we can pull that out and what can we do with that. And that's certainly Heidegger's method with like, you know, the so-called history of being. And I think Arendt does exactly the same thing with the so-called history of political thought. Um, but Heidegger's sentence is, it is always a sign of the greatness of a productive achievement, meaning the philosopher. Um, there's always a sign of a greatness of a productive achievement when it can let issue from itself the demand that it should be understood better than it understands itself. Or in other words, the greatness of any political thinker is what he doesn't say because if nothing else, he doesn't quite have the vocabulary yet. Um, he's mucking around with something that isn't really fully fleshed out yet because it's, it's new. Um, you could say it's an act of this wonderment kind of thing. But I think, uh, that, I say that partly because I just really love that quote from Heidegger, but I think Arendt's trying to do the same thing. And with tradition, I think what she's saying is she uses tradition in, in a little bit different ways, I think, and I don't mean that as a problem, um, but tradition as foundation so seems to be kind of okay with, but, just, but tradition as far as like following in the footsteps kind of thing, that seems to be what she has a problem with. And she says, going back to the, to the tradition, what she said in the first essay we read is the problem is um, if we have like political actions and philosophical thought, those are two disparate things. What happened is philosophy stepped in and claimed rule over political action. And that's where things started going awry. And that's, to rent. that's the source of the problem. Or you could say, if you really want to screw something up, start thinking philosophically about it. Um, I just like saying that. But, uh, oh. but, but, but I think that's kind of her point is, let's get back to what was going on maybe before philosophy stepped in and did its thing. And like what you said, Roger, before it started excluding all the stuff that didn't fit into its schema. That did not fit into his categories of thought. Yeah. Well, I just want to be clear. Go ahead. I don't think it's a nostalgic project of let's get back. Oh no, no, not at all. No, uh, no. It's, it's, so it's, it's definitely not the idea. Let's go back to this. She wants to try to find out maybe something that's there that we didn't see. It's definitely not a go back. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry if it sounded that way, but yep. yeah, you're, you're totally right. Um, <laughs> because the world changes. You know, part of the problem is. You know, when we say things like, well, what did the founders mean? 200, well, that's 200 years ago, which okay. is pretty sure. let me Let me go on, okay? Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Jennifer? Okay, so every time I read Hannah Arendt, I always want to bring it into my modern world, whatever that is, modern. And when I, I read this and I loved it, and when I kept going over this common sense and our tradition and how we pull things from the past. And right now I see a breaking apart. It's sort of a mini tradition, I guess, not what she's talking about, of the transition to the next president. Yeah. It's a breaking apart of that tradition where it's not maybe written down, 
but we all have this common sense that, okay, you know, they lost, we won, or the other way, and now we're going to move on. But this breaking apart is causing terror amongst my friends, and I don't watch television. I haven't kept up with it. I'm just listening to what people say, and I feel like they're on unsteady ground with all of this. And I, it just brings, when I read this essay, I kept thinking about some of these things. Am I correct on that? I know I'm bringing it into a very small space. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a good point. Um, you know, what she's going, what, when she says, if we speak of the end of tradition, um, you know, the, she's using end in, in sort of a double sense. Uh, on the one hand, the culmination, right? And on the other hand, um, the break or the the end of it. Um, uh, you know, she's going to develop this idea over the next few years that um, uh, that you know, philosophically, the tradition ends with Marx, um, and maybe even. Um, you know, begins earlier to end with the rise of science in the 17th century, but that the event that really breaks the tradition is totalitarianism um, is going to be her her point uh, going forward. Um, uh, and so it's once this tradition breaks, uh, it ceases to be able to um, uh, provide any kind of um, uh, guidance for us. And when we say, well, you have to follow norms, you have to follow traditions, people say, phooey, right? Um, the norms and traditions are gone. You don't follow them either. It's just you're hypocrites, right? And I think you can see where I'm going with this. Um, once the tradition is broken, what you see over and over again are efforts by one group to align themselves with tradition and say, we represent tradition. And the other group says, you don't represent tradition. You're just cynically, hypocritically using it. And I'm just going to blow that tradition up. And um, from Arendt's point of view, uh, certainly since the late 19th and early 20th century, um, uh, the the tradition has lost its capacity uh, to be our to be our guide, to give us rules uh, in any meaningful way that are accepted by common sense. Um, and once that tradition is broken, once it's lost, um, you know, politics is without banisters, right? As she's going to to argue, or as we've read in different texts. And, and we're stuck. And, and, you know, there are going to be times in which it's pretty calm and people sort of go along as if the traditions maybe were there and whatever. Uh, but there are going to be times when those traditions um, seem to many people as simply power, not traditions, hypocr hypocrisy. And uh, they say, why don't we just blow them up? Because they're not really uh, meaningful. Um, so yeah, I think I think what you're seeing is one in many times over the last hundred years, right? This right. is not the only time, right? Uh, in which um, uh, the a certain political group has become convinced that the traditions are not common sense or true or authoritative or religious, uh, but are simply acts of power guaranteeing one group um, power over another group. And they are saying pox on your traditions. I think that's how we can understand it. Okay. Fran. Hi. Um, I would like to further understand like the idea of the beginning and how that is related to action. Mm -hmm. And I want to, to go to this quote uh, on page 59, where, she, where Hannah Arendt quotes um, Augustine and says, that a beginning be made 
um, humans were created before whom nobody was. And um, I guess um, that sounds like it was a big deal. It was like the doers of great deeds did that and it was like a glorious event uh, that could be tied then to the idea of action. But then she goes on the capacity for beginning um, to the fact that every human being is already by nature a new beginning that never before had appeared and be seen in the world. So what I like to understand is um, how this beginning or is tied to the idea of action and when this beginning, let's say of creating a new human on, a hum on human terms is just like a continuation of nature. It's just a natural thing that continues. Okay. Um, natural thing that continues. So um, this idea of beginning, right, is going to be one of her central themes, right? She's going to give it a number of names in her work. One is spontaneity uh, and one is natality. Um, uh, natality or a kind of quality of birthliness, being born, um, uh, suggests that when a human being is born, um, that when a, when that a beginning be made, man was created, um, that human being is a kind of free atom in a certain way. Um, where they go and how they'll collide with others and what they might do is unpredictable, right? Against the Leibnizian idea of, uh, of a monad that is predetermined through God in a harmonious reality, right? Um, Arendt is going to argue that that all uh, be human is to be a beginning. That every in every human being, there's the possibility of unexpected things, un, un, a new start. Those new starts can be small or they can be big, depending on whether other people um, respond to them or not. Um, so. Uh, in that sense, a human being is different than a rock, uh, which follows natural laws and can't start something new. Um, a human being is free. And um, it is the freedom of a human being um, that makes them a possible new beginning. Um, uh, the danger that we're going to see in the tradition, right, is that from Plato through to Marx, what you see is the working out of an attempt to um, uh, control human beings through um, first uh, rational laws and then empirical and historical laws of development. Um, uh, and so um, the idea that human beings follow laws are lawful characters like for Darwin or for Marx uh, is for Arendt um, the, the sort of culmination of this attempt to intellectually control and master and limit the freedom and um, uh, beginningness or spontaneity or natality of man. Uh, and so, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask one more thing? Like I, I, I get that, but I'm interested in the in the actual act of making a new human. Like it seems to me that when the gods are doing it, it's like a big deal. It's like a big deed. But when humans are doing it. Um, when they're like fertilizing eggs, then it's more something that occurs naturally, that kind of like um, it. And therefore, my question is, the, our idea of human action, is that measured on the scale of the gods where, where you do something great or like where they did something great or is, um, or is it just a natural uh, occurrence that um, 
continues to human race? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, in the tradition of political thought, gods can't do things great because gods follow rules. They follow rationality, they're pure reason. Um, and so they're, while they're free, they're not really free, at least according to Kant and for most of the history of, of reason, because they actually have to follow rational rules. Freedom um, is the uh, capacity of only rational beings, according to Kant, angels and, and humans, um, who can choose either to be rational or to be irrational. And that's the essence of freedom, at least within the philosophical tradition. Um, within the political tradition that Arendt is, is talking about, um, she's giving you three examples of free acts in this essay, right? One is do something great, unexpected, you know, risk your life to make, you know, to, for history as Achilles does, right? Or, um, uh, you know, and, or, or found a new state, like uh, a, new, a new civilization, like Aeneas does, or start a revolution like the Americans and French did, um, or uh, forgive somebody. These are all unexpected, surprising, um, free acts. Um, they're not the acts of gods, right? So for her, gods can't be free like this. They're the acts of humans. Um, uh, and there is no such thing as free action without humanity. That's what she thinks Augustine says in this quote, that there be a beginner, a beginning, that there be free action. Man was created, um, not gods, but man. Is that helpful? Is that, I don't know if that's what you were asking, but if it is. Um, that's good to know. I didn't know that the gods had to follow the rules. I thought it was the other way around. Well, no, I mean, the, it's, not that they, it's not that the gods have to follow rules given by someone else, but they have to follow the rules that they give, or at least the, at least the, the Christian God. I mean, the Greek gods are a little different, um, but the Christian God, you know, has to act rationally, has to act good. Everything they do has to be for the good. Um, okay. That's why the theodicy, you know, is about showing that even evil in the world was done in the end for good. Thank you. Yep. J Jennifer? Hi, Jennifer. I didn't mean to. Oh, you didn't want, you don't have a question? Um, Oh, Fran, I'm sorry, you already did. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry that you guys haven't. Clara, I'm sorry. I got to figure this out. Clara. Hello, Roger. Um, yes, I have a question. Can we move to the part that um, Aaron introduces a R.H. Barrow? Say that again. Can we move? Yo, R.H. To... R. R. H. Barrows, when it says uh, the Romans, she is making a quotation. It's like in the middle of the chapter. The problem is that that I have this edition of. I'm just not. I'm, I guess I'm having trouble understanding what you said. R. A. Sparrows, the birds, or, or, or. No, 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 no. Can you go to the page? I, I have another edition. I have a hardcover edition of uh what's the paragraph begin with Clara? roger i think okay. it's 51 and it's, it's in uh the romans by rh barrow oh rh okay i apologize i it's I, not no. the, the 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 movie <laughs> <laughs> okay okay yes. let's go um thank you thank you Daphne. are you able to find to find a uh, because the chart the church the sentence begins with because the church in its role. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Can you read that paragraph? Because if, if I read, it's not so clear as if you read because it's not my native language. Uh, I think it's clear, but okay. Because the church in its role as the new protector of the Roman Empire had kept intact 
the essentially Roman trinity of religion, authority, and tradition. It could eventually become Rome's heir, and often men in membership of the Christian church, the sense of citizenship, which neither Rome nor, nor, nor municipality could any longer offer them. Oh, okay, Aro okay, Roger. Thank you. Yeah, the Romans. Da, 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 da. Okay, uh, thank you, um, uh, Roger. So what I want to ask is, for us, for a Christian, by that time, the membership of the of the Christian Church was a source of of uh, sense of citizenship. That's what is. Mm -hmm. That's what it says here. Am I right? Yes. Okay. That's R. H. Barrow. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is there is something similar for the Jewish people by 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 then? That's a great question. Um Yeah. What was what was the source of a sen sense of citizenship for Jews Jewish people by that time? That means you so it's an excellent question, Clara. I mean, uh, you know, um, I just need a second to, uh, to, to think about it. Um, and if anyone wants to jump in, they're welcome to, but I need to, I just need a second. Um, the, 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 the Christian, she's, she's talking here about um uh the transfer of 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 tradition from from rome to uh christianity um one of the things that i would i i think uh i would say is that um the the jewish uh people somewhat like the greek people um, for Arendt, don't have um, uh, a concept of tradition in the sense that um, Arendt is here talking about. Um, the Can I give it a shot, Roger? Yeah, go, go for it, Daphna. I think that um, in the Jewish um, tradition in inception, perhaps the idea of uh, monotheism became a sort of mark of coherence and collectivism. I think today, if we're talking about a sense of citizenship and looking back, it has to do um, with nationality, nationalism, very much like um, the Christians today, except that the Jews were always dispersed. So the idea of being collective or a collective or being part of a group really had to do exclusively with religion. Very little to do with um, place, uh, very little to do with nationality, very little to do with being a citizen in a public uh, space because those public spaces were everywhere. Um, and Hannah Arendt writes about the Jews having no history um, she writes about that a lot. The Jews had no history and therefore were much more susceptible to being put upon by history. It's a very long question how Hannah Arendt deals with it, but I think if you read her Jewish writings, she talks about that a lot. Yeah, that's a great point. And I'll, I'll just add Ma that Ma for Arendt, um, the Jews uh, don't have uh, a politics for most of their history. Um, they're much more, um, they live much more uh, a kind of um, private life as opposed to a, a political life. This is part of her analysis of, of, of why the Jews uh, could become uh, victims of totalitarianism in, in the origins. Um, um she doesn't think that there's a, an overriding, as, as Daphna rightly said, Jewish history um, or Jewish politics. It's much more um, dispersed and, and broken up. I know I have some of them have been, so I'll, I'll shut up. 
Yeah, th this is this is Mara. Thank you. Um, respect uh, with respect to the the, the, the issue of, of 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 Jews and, and and citizenship. I think that even before in the text, there's an explanatory gap between these um, foundation of Rome, you know, with citizenship and this um, transfer to citizen ship you know to the catholic church i mean that's something that is more an assumption i wouldn't call it citizenship and 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 part of the confusion is also that then you lump together you know as the judeo christian tradition but that is an area of confusion that i do not know how to work um conceptually but 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 um if I may add, I mean, Daphna wrote a book about this, so I don't have much more to add to her expert opinion. But in Eichmann in Jerusalem, um, Aden make, makes a point about the Jewish people uh, with idea as this kind of imagined territoriality or this space in between that may be considered uh, not citizenship because for Aden citizenship is very clear, you know, attached to the existence of the state and, and the existence of a political community, but she's taking that in between among Jews as, yeah, as, as, as a kind of common belonging to. I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay. Mara, but just remember that in this part of the book, we are not talking about citizenship. We are talking a sense of citizenship, which is quite different. Well, sure. I think the, so. um, this is yes, but this is why I brought it up because citizenship, in strict sense, is 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 not there. I mean, that's why I said in sense in terms of a, an imagined territoriality, which is this imagined space in between. This is how Arendt in Eichmann in Jerusalem justifies the prerogative of the um, of the court of the Israeli court to deal with you know these crimes. Thank you, Clara. Gracias. Clara, Clara let me um, point us a little bit just in the a few sentences before where you started. Right, Arendt um, on page fifty in the beginning of this paragraph that you started at, she says the Christian hey, church- Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, okay, 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 Roger, I am there. The Christian church as a public institution that inherited the Roman political conception of religion could overcome the strong anti-institutional anti -institutional tendency of the Christian creed that is so often in the New Testament. So the church, which is what she's talking about as um, the traditional inheritor of the Roman Trinity in which people have a citizen is distinct from the Christian creed, creed in the New Testament. Then she says, um, summoned by Constantine even before the fall of Rome to win for the declining empire, the protection of the most powerful God and to rejuvenate the Roman religion whose gods were no longer powerful enough, the church, again, not the creed, but the church, already had a tradition of its own based on the life and deeds of Jesus as related in the gospels. Its foundation stone became and has remained ever since not mere Christian faith or Jewish obedience to divine law, but rather the given testimony of the autores from which it derives its own authority, as long as it hands down tradere, as tradition from generation to generation. So what I take her to be saying here is the reason that the church has citizenship in the sense that Barrow is talking about is because it is an institution, a public institution that um, seeks to carry down uh, a testimony of authoritative sources, the church fathers, as rules that are authoritative. And in this sense, it's different from either the creed of Christianity based on what 
the law that lives in one's heart, or the Judaism of the idea of uh, uh, following the law of the book or the Bible or the Torah um, and obedience to divine law, neither of which are public authority, are institutions of public authority. Um, uh, they're both um, much more open to um, uh, individual human action. The Christian in the sense that they follow the law in the heart, the Jew in the sense that they have to, in obeying divine law, um, uh, choose to uh, live under incredible uh, uh, legalistic requirements, but in doing so there has to be a faith in it. Um, these are different from a public institution that passes down traditions um, which are to uh, govern uh, uh, citizens as sort of a, a necessary public ideal. And I take that to be uh, Arendt's, Arendt's point here. Um, Roger, uh, yeah. I'd like to add something here, if I may. Um, and I just want to go back to the historical moment, which is that prior to the rise of Christianity, uh, the Jew, Judaism and the Jews actually had a state, so to speak. They had citizenship. There were uh, there was a there was a, um, a hierarchy of authority, um, which over time began to decay, and the and Christian the Christian movement uh, begins as a revolution against the authority of of the Jewish Church, so to speak, um, and uh, and then over the next couple of centuries, it's an underground movement, which eventually gets. Um, uh, uh, achieves parity with the existing uh, the existing power that is Constantine makes it official within the Roman world. So there, there's a, a kind of a power thing going on, uh, which I think of as political, uh, which begins with the the uh, decay of the power of the of the priest priesthood and the and uh, the prior kingdom for the Jews. And then uh, uh, it's transformed uh, in, uh, into the power of Christendom. That's helpful. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it. So anyone, anyway, let's, I want to, I mean, these are fascinating question, and I thank Clara for bringing it up. It's not something I've thought a lot about, to be honest. Um, but I'd love to, if anyone wants to add another comment or we should move on. Um, can I ask, it's, yeah. it's between a comment and a question. Um, so it, it's for me, it's more of a movement of a membership to um, at a territorial city state, to a membership to a religion that can travel and cross. So you have a foundation as Rome, as a, as a place to come back to. However, your right of access and your right of way comes from the membership to this group. While in Greek cities, were more of like belonging to a city state and that what gives you the right of access. I'm not sure if this is correct, but um, this evoked like the idea of membership and citizenship as, as a way of access and right and also a sense of belonging to a collective that should somehow defend you and take you in. So I don't know if, if she, I think she also means that somehow because she was talking about Rome as foundation, but in the same time she was talking about Greek cities as you know, moving, colonizing, and going, finding new things, but not coming back. So I would, I want to think about it from this, from this part of, uh, of the, or from this perspective, I would say. Okay, thank you, Leila. Uh, Stephen, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, just a, a historical sidebar. I often seem to be following uh, Jack Hirschfeld's excellent comments. Uh, but in the Christian tradition, the Constantinian turn in 313 is thought uh, by the peace churches, that is the Anabaptist Mennonite churches, to have been a horrible mistake. Uh, the peace churches distinguish themselves from the so-called magisterial churches, the uh, Reformed and, and Lutheran. Just a little historical bit there. Yeah, and I, I mean... 
I'm not a, a scholar of, of this period. And, you know, I, many of you are, I, I, I'm hesitant to, to, to question Jack's, but Jack sort of said that Christianity and was a rebellion against the Jewish church for, for lack of a better word, I think was actually the word Jack used. Um, you know, uh, I mean, that's not my impression of, I mean, you know, yes, I mean, even even the the Bible is a is a somewhat late and somewhat um, uh, decentralized, uh, uh, except for Deuteronomy, which is very late, um, I, idea of 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 obedience, um, and and it does strike me that um, to talk of a Jewish church seems seems uh seems uh anachronistic uh to me there was it was a much more uh uh you know local rabbinically led by different rabbis in different places with common texts and traditions but uh seems much less like a, a unitary church as a public institution structure but again i'm not an expert in this world so if i'm wrong you know jack or steven or or Daphna, you know, correct me. I'm, I'm not exactly. Uh, this is not. A, this this may be just a matter of interpretation. But the rabbinical tradition actually doesn't really begin until uh, the the uh, diaspora, until the destruction of the Second Temple. Mm -hmm. uh, up until then, the the, the 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 religion is is encased in the temple. It's the that's that's what I mean by that. And there is an authority. There's a there is a, 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 a class, a, a class of priests who, um, who generate the, the citizenship for the Jews. That's what's happening up until the destruction of the second temple and the rabbinical tradition, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is the hallmark of the diaspora really represents the collapse of that church. That's what it is, or that, that I, I call it a church, but that structure. Um, and that happens to be more or less simultaneous with the rise of, of uh, Christianity. Uh, we we date we date Christianity theoretically from the year one, right, one AD, and uh, and we say that Jesus uh, died in thirty three. That's what we say. Uh, but actually, the Gospels date from right about the period of the uh, begin really from right about the period of the. Of the destruction of this, uh, the, the destruction of the temple, so um, in seventy A.D. So, so it's so there is really a kind of a coincidence between the two, and then if you and in fact the early the early Christians were in fact Jews, but they were Jews who adopted a subversive uh, ideology. Uh, <laughs> I'm reluctant to call it an ideology because. Hanar means something different by ideology, but that's what it is. They adopt this different point of view, which has been advanced by these underground rebels, uh, and that's why I think of it as a revolution. Um, uh, the Jesus represent Jesus is the representation of a whole group of Jews who were trying to find a different way because the 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 um, the I, I hate to put it this way, but the church was in decay. And so, um, and so they lived out there in the desert, and, uh, creating some new ideas, and and uh, and eventually, um, uh, these got crystallized into what we and, into the religion that we call Christ Christianity. And then, in the early years of Christianity, there were many churches. Uh, Paul was all over the was all over the Mediterranean, establishing churches, and and then each one of those had its own, if I may use the word, tradition until the fifth century when, when the, it all coalesced and when Rome accepted Christianity as an official religion. And, and, and I mean, this is, uh, this is an, all of this is my own crazy interpretation of history, but th that's, those are the events that actually occurred at the time. And that, I think that's, I, I think that's a, a, for me, that's a really good way to think about how um, uh, Christianity uh, establishes itself yeah. as a state within a state, in effect, yeah. and eventually becomes the, and it remains a state within a state right up until 
uh, the, pretty much the uh, the 16th century. Yeah. So um, okay. anyway, it, I, I'm I'm going off in a totally different direction, uh, but I, but I think that f I, I wanted to be clear about how I thought about this relationship between Judaism and Christianity and in the context of what Hannah Arendt is talking about as tradition. Right. Just, I'm gonna try and bring- Can I, can I just read a, a, two sentences um, about a his, Israeli historian by the name of Shlomo Zan? It'll take one second, Roger. Yep. Okay. He uses uh, a profusion of historical document who searched all the literature available about the Jews through the centuries he cites documents that record proselytism and conversion from Flavius Josephus of the late first century Christian era to the early Christianized Roman communities, to various Arab tribes, to the Berbers in North Africa, and later to the 10th century Khazar kingdom. His research establishes the Jews lived outside the Holy Land for centuries, regardless of their faith, and often by choice, as members of communities in which they lived, whether in Babylonia, Persia, or Europe. So, you know, just to show kind of how difficult it is to um, c create the same, as Clara suggested, sense of citizenship. Yeah, I, 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 I think I, that's really helpful. And I, 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 I hope that, I think that goes along with what I was trying to say, that there was no church of, of this. Um, to bring us back to the text, and I hope maybe put a bow on this, um, you know, Arendt, uh, um, on page 43, makes this distinction that modern historical consciousness and the birth of tradition um, both happen um, when we make the decision to date time chronologically. So the, the paragraph uh, early on in the text that begins the end of our tradition is neither the end of history nor the nor of the past. Um, and she says, modern historical consciousness began and found its conclusive expression when not more than two centuries ago, the old practice of numbering the centuries um, from one definite starting point, the foundation of Rome, for instance, or the birth of Christ, or even the beginning of the Hebrew calendar was abandoned for the sake of numbering backward, forward and backward from the year one. And what's important is not that Christ was the turning point or the birth of Christ, but that now both past and future now lead to an infinity of time. And what you now have is the possibility of um, in uh, a double perspective, she says, into infinity, um, uh, which contradicts the biblical myth of creation but also limits the much older and more general question as to whether historical time can have a beginning. Um, it's very chronology that the modern age has established kind of potential earthly immortality for mankind. And so it's, it's this, both the, both the early Christians and the Jews and the Greeks, all of them did not have this, um, earthly mortality, immortality, where they, they could live forever. It's only with the rise of a chronology of time that, um, that goes infinitely back and infinitely forward that we can have a tradition um, that could claim to be immortal. And, and that, those, that tradition um, is what she's talking about as the kind of public institution uh, whether it be uh, the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire, the Roman Trinity, or the Catholic Trinity, that can that can live forever. Um, so uh, I think uh, I hope that may be helpful, and maybe we'll move on. Nancy, it's a, it's kind of a different tack. Can you? Good. I want to get out of that one. Yeah, okay. that was a great. It was a great discussion. I just you know let's go. Let's move move on. Okay. Um, I'm uh, perplexed by um, the way that uh, Arendt characterizes the pre-polis. Um, she doesn't seem to give much value to the kind of multiplicity and the, the lack of um, codification of one right way of doing things, but the kind of 
multipli the, the multiplicity of possibilities in the archaic period of ancient Greece that precedes the classical period seems to me to have some of the um, uh, attributes and some of the qualities that she is very interested in moving toward. And I particularly, I, I, don't, I don't know if she has anything in her writings on Hesiod's theogony, but I think in particular, the consideration of Greek polytheism uh, opens up so many um, uh, gaps and places for uh, the existence of different approaches to what's important and to values and to so on that that I would ex would have ex I feel like that even the text of Hesiod doesn't really fit into her characterization of the pre polis so I mean it's a huge it's a huge amount of material to try to uh, I always have this problem with her, her she seems to reduce a period to something very um, like a label that is very confining and doesn't take into account so many of the particulars. But that's, that's yeah, kind well, of something so, I'd like to pursue more because uh, if there's a really good book on her treatment of ancient Greek materials uh, by a second, you know, by another philosopher, that would be useful to me because I'm, I'm always sort of catching up. The, I'm still thinking about that while we move on and it's, um, you know, her categories bother me when she's talking about material that I know pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, there have been a lot of books recently on her, her use of, on Rome. Um, the sort of standard reading of Arendt is, is, is through the Greeks. And so most of the re writing on Arendt early, you know, a lot of it uh, deals with her reading on the Greeks. Um, maybe someone will come up with a, a good source for Nancy, but- um, Can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yes, this is Spiros. Hi Spiros. Brother, how are you? Good. Uh, I think that I have the, the answer uh, the way that Arne is, uh, is is thinking about this kind of uh, of polis, which is the, the pre polis, as as you said, has realized from has been realized from Cornelius Castoriadis, the Greek philosopher who reads exactly in the same way the pre polis from Hesiod uh, until Th Thucydides before Plato and Aristotle. And I think I, strong, I strongly believe or support uh, that uh, Castoriadis is a very good way, the reading of Castoriadis, I mean, in order to understand Arendt's republicanism. I mean, how Hannah Arendt looks, okay, this kind of pre polis, which is before Plato and Aristotle, from Homer to Thucydides. And in this way, I urge you to, to read Castoriadis, Cornelius Castoriadis, the famous, the eminent Greek philosopher. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Do you know if, if Arendt is actually reading or citing Castoriadis anywhere? Just the opposite, the other way around, Roger. Yeah. Castoriadis <laughs> quotes all the time Han Arendt. This is very interesting. And from my, from my point of view, Castoriadis it's, it's a, in a sense, okay, uh, an Arantian thinker, uh, so to speak, if I could say so. <laughs> in yeah. a sense, he continues Hannah Arendt's thought. He continues Hannah Arendt's republicanism. I'm talking about the late Castoriadis, okay? Not the, the Castoriadis as a Lacanian thinker or the Castoriadis as a Trotskyist, okay? I'm talking about the late Castoriadis, since 1970s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, to, would you put, excuse me, would you put um, a couple of references in the chat of what you think pertains particularly in, to this in the late? Oh, you can see, you can see the late Castoriadis, okay, his whole but, work. Okay, okay. All right, thanks. Just to, you know, I mean, Nancy, this is a, this is a lecture, right? So it's, it's not a long book. It's a, it's a short lecture. Um, 
there will be uh, more um, on the Greeks specifically uh, in the human condition, right? So uh, specifically, um, well, in a number of chapters, but in this chapter on action and also early on in the public private realm, there'll be a fair bit more with lots of footnotes to Greek, to Greek thinking, if that's um, helpful. Um, but I mean, I, I, your, your, your overarching question about why doesn't she accept the multiplicity? Um, I guess maybe I didn't understand it because I mean, her whole, her whole claim here is that for the Greeks, um, there's a kind of multiplicity that people can act freely uh, you know, set aside, don't set aside, let's at least acknowledge that she largely has in mind and the Greeks largely had in mind citizens who were men and white, or not white, men and not slaves. Um, uh, but, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of, um, uh, capacity to start things anew that she finds incredibly thrilling about the Greeks. Um, and thus, it doesn't yet come under a kind of rulership. Um, and that's what she, and that's what Aristotle and Plato begin to rebel against. They say we have to create a polis that's, that, that, that is limited and protects philosophies and philosophers. And we have to rebel against this sort of um, freedom and, and openness of it and bring it under some order um, and begin thinking about how to create an intellectual tradition that would order and constrain the variety and multiplicity of actions in a polis. Um, you know, she doesn't uh, go into it historically with the kind of historical uh, color that maybe one would want, but maybe I'm, did, is, that, is that what you were talking about? I see, no, I, I agree. I just felt like in this essay, it seemed like she was making a category that was a little tight from mm -hmm. my understanding of that period. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is her, I mean, this kind of work, as I said, it's a little more academic. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's making a claim about a, a long tradition from Plato to Marx in a very short text. Um, uh, in, in some other texts you'll write in the next few years, um, the modern challenge to tradition uh, in between past and future, she'll, she'll, she'll make this in a longer argument. Um, and, uh, and yet it's still a pretty complicated and, and academic argument. So, and yeah, I think, you know, as, as we were talking about last week, uh, you know, she, she reads Plato in a very aggressive way. She reads Aristotle in a very aggressive way. She, it's, it's not, a, it, it's, it's designed to make her point. Steve Greenleaf, you're up. Thanks. Um, I have uh, a sentence on page 50, kind of where we've been hovering that served as a bit of a teaser. So I have some questions and comments on the result of that. It says, whenever the Pax Romana of the Roman Empire spread, what ultimately emerged as Western civilization, this Roman trinity took root together with the Roman notion of human community as societus, the living together of soci, men allied on the basis of good faith. Um, this idea intrigues me, and I wonder if she developed it elsewhere. I think of her treatment of society later on in modernity as something very different, apolitical, where it strikes me that what she's saying here uh, could have political implications, uh, somewhat similar to a Greek polis. It also makes me think of Tocqueville's identification of voluntary associations in the early American political experience as uh, political entities 
outside the formality of government. So did she develop this line of thought or explore this line of thought uh, later on and make any of these connections? Um, you know, I, I think, uh, I think the, the, the use of the, the word societas, the living together of Soshi, man allied on the basis of, of good faith. Um, um, is, uh, yeah. Um, what I want to say, and, and I, and I'm, I, I'll, I'll say that I'm, I'm not 100% confident in what I'm about to say. Um, but what I want to say is that she's using the society or soci here, um, as a, as a marker for what she's going to call the social, mm -hmm. um, and thus the, uh, the rise of uh, what she's calling good faith here as a sense of the one, the one man, that everyone has to be the same. It's a kind of um, rejection of plurality. Um, and, and so uh, the, the, the point here is that wherever this Roman trinity of authority, religion, and tradition takes root as a binding force as an authoritative beginning, um, everybody largely agrees. There's a strong tradition, a strong common sense, and um, and and there's a a kind of loss of plurality and action um, uh, in in such a world. And thus, the full strength of this Roman spirit. Um, uh, uh, emerges with the Christian church um, and the, the resurrection of Christ is the cornerstone on which another permanent institution was founded again, where there's a, a strong common sense that uses the traditional data and creates a, a, a community of goodwill in which everyone largely believes the same thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, while there's a kind of um, benign way to read society, as I think you were reading it, Steve, um, as sort of everyone's a we and we're happy and we all agree and we're in a goodwill. Um, I think this somewhat refers to what Bill T. Jones was warning against a few weeks ago about the we. Um, there's, a, there's a danger in a society where everyone shares goodwill, which is that there's a sense that we all agree and, and we all share the same authority and tradition. Um, and uh, we uh, deny difference in plurality and, and meaningful disagreement. I, I, well, it's interesting. I, I have read other, I think at least one other political thinker that bases uh, his political thought on the Roman idea of society and builds through that. And I, I, I guess- Yerko or someone else? Uh, uh, no, uh, Collingwood in oh, the, Collingwood. the new Leviathan. Yeah. And that, um, it, I, I've always wondered if Arndt's use of society, especially in, in, in modernity, isn't a little idiosyncratic compared to others. Um, and whether, whether other thinkers share her sense that this is too conformist mm -hmm. a way of thinking. Yeah, look, Arendt's reading of the social, which is connected to society, um, is obviously one of the most controversial aspects of her, of her work for a whole host of reasons. Um, but I think what, you know, we, we have to remember is that while she values society as a as a as a as a social and non-public uh, um, way of being together with like-minded people, she is deeply suspicious of society as a political uh, as a political idea. 
And um, I think that's what, which is one of the reasons why, you know, I mean, we, we talk a lot about Arendt talking about the end of tradition and later the break of tradition. And a lot of people think, oh my God, the break of tradition, it's terrible, it's a crisis. That's not how Arendt reads it. And I think that's an important mm -hmm. thing for us to realize as we're reading this, this work on tradition. For Arendt, the, the end of tradition has a lot of positive aspects to it. It's freeing. It frees us from this um, focus on rulership and obedience and opens up the possibility of living without banisters, which for her can be a very positive thing. Um, uh, but it's also somewhat terrifying and, and, and dangerous. Um, uh, I see two more questions. Stephen, did you already ask yours or is this a new question? This is a new one, Roger, but maybe you'd like to go to the next person because I've already had a turn. If you can ask it quickly, I'll, I'll take two questions. All right, here it is. Um, like someone else has mentioned, I think it was Nancy, about uh, Arendt's categories. When I read her, uh, Arendt's talk about uh, statesmen, I s sort of immediately thought of uh, diplomats, but I take it that she means strictly legislators. Would that be correct? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank State you. Statesman, the, the statesman is another word for a pol politician. All right. Um, Plato's um, yeah. uh, statesman is, is, a, is a politician. Yes, that, yes. That's the word she's using. Fair enough, thank you. Yeah, Nick. Uh, yeah, Roger. Uh, in some ways, you've already uh, just mentioned what, what my point is. But on page 55, I would just like to read that uh, last sentence of the last paragraph on page 55. Philosophy, wherever and whenever it reached true greatness, had to break even its own tradition. But the same cannot be said of political thought, with the result the political philosophy became more tradition bound than any other branch of Western metaphysics. And I underline this because I think this is the key thing for me takeaway in here. And you had mentioned it earlier in that, I, I mean, in some ways it's kind of a uh, putting political, trying to put political philosophy in the, in, 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 in the, in the, in, in the shoes of philosophy by, by saying that the most important thing for us is action and speech of, of great, men of great deeds. This is what politics is about. And with these, with the notion of natality that was brought in, then everything, new things come about, which are, which can be great, which can be harmful, but new things. And so, so to me, this is kind of, this would be this particular, where, where a lot of talk is about tradition. This would be tradition. This is a very iconoclastic notion of, of anything we do will break tradition, tends to break tradition. Politics, it should be about breaking tradition and breaking new things. And this is a, like you say, scary. And I think a great takeaway. I mean, she doesn't say it offhand. You have to kind of connect the dots. And maybe, I don't even know that she says it in her human condition. I don't remember it that way. But, but, but juxtaposition tradition to that notion of, of action keep, makes it clear that she is a, a radical iconoclast and somewhat scary if you are a traditionalist. Yeah, uh, she's certainly not a traditionalist. And that's why the end of tradition has a positive element. Um, she will talk about this a bit in the, a fair bit in the human condition, but she's certainly gonna talk about it in the, in the long essay that we're gonna read in, two we in a few weeks in this book called Introduction to Politics. I mean, that essay is about that. It's about how politics is what we're most afraid of. And that tradition is an anti-political um, uh, uh, anti -political, um, institutional development, which we cling to. This goes back to who asked the question very early on about the tradition Trump and, and I forget who asked that question. It was a good question. Um, but- I did. Yes, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, we, we I'm sorry, I, I just, but, you know, we cling to the tradition because we're scared of the disorder of politics. 
And, um, and that's what the introduction to politics essay is all about. The, the way in which um, we hate politics. We hate politics so much that even once tradition is dead, we keep clinging to it because we're scared of what would happen if we actually um, entered into a world of politics. Um, and uh, so I think Nick to say that she's a, uh, what do you saw her, uh, anti-traditional what? Uh, you said it was a great word. Iconoclast. Iconoclast. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that's right. I think that's a, a very effective way to, to say it. So listen, thank you all. Um, just a quick reminder, if you came on a little late, we're going to, we're not meeting next week, which is Thanksgiving. We will meet December 4th and we're gonna read two essays. Um, the next two, the, the essay on Montesquieu's revision of tradition and from Hegel to Marx, they're short. So it's only a total of 17 pages. Fun for your Thanksgiving turkey break since you're all gonna be alone, I hope, and, and, mm -hmm. not, uh, and not breaking the quarantine. But uh, have a very happy holiday and uh, see you in two weeks. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. Thank you very much.